Well, hey, good morning. There we go. That's, some of you had to swim here, so I'm, I'm glad you made it. It feels like when it's rainy and gray outside, I need a little extra juice from you guys, so it'd be great to have you. If I don't know you, my name's Pastor Greg. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so glad that you're here. And I believe that God has you here for a reason, that, that you came through that nasty weather to be here because God wants to speak to you. And so I pray that he would open your ears, your heart, and your mind to what it is that he wants to say to you. It's not about me, but it's about you. But before we get there, we have to start here. We gotta start with Dr. Seuss, right? I mean, maybe this is one of the most famous Christmas books of all time, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and there's about 712 different versions of the movie None of them are that great. Maybe the, the Kim, what's the guy? Benedict uh, Cumber, help me, students. Yeah, they're asleep. Okay, come on, you're not helpful. But well, do you know the story? There's this green looking thing who's just grumpy and mean, right? And, and, his, and, and Dr. Seuss tells us that his heart is what? How many sizes too small? Three. It's actually two sizes too small. Go to the source. Two sizes too small. Right, And so it's Christmas Eve and he hears down in Whoville because he lives on Mount Crumpet, which is just north of Whoville. He hears all the who's and they're all excited about Christmas but because his heart is two sizes too small. He's mad. And so he comes up with this great plan. He's gonna put on a Santa Claus suit. He's gonna get his little dog Max to be the, uh, Max to be the, the reindeer. And he's gonna go down to the Whovilles and he's gonna steal all their presents. He's gonna steal all their uh, decorations and trees and all their food, which would really upset me, food. And he's even gonna steal their log and because he wants to stop Christmas from coming, right? And then what happens? He gets all of this in a sled and the dog pulls it up a hill, which is, Basically impossible, but it works in the book. And he goes up to the top of this mountain, and right as he's getting ready to shove all of the trees and the presents and the food and the log off the hill into the abyss, he hears what? They're singing the song down here. Ah, Right? He hears joy, and he thinks, how can that be? I just stole all your stuff, but yet you're at peace. You have joy. And then he says these famous words. Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas means a little bit more. And then his heart grows, and here's the trick, three sizes bigger. So what's the point? The point to the story is That you can take all the presents, you can take all the food, you can take all the stuff, you can even take the log out of the fireplace, but you couldn't take what? Christmas. See, the Who's, in spite of all of their circumstances, in spite of what was going on in their life, they still responded with joy. They still responded with peace. What is that? You know somebody like that? Like you know them, like you really know them. You know what's going on in their life. Like their life is not easy. They are, they're facing circumstances in life that are hard, that are tough, and you know this about them. And yet, peace. And, and, and you think to yourself, and you don't say this out loud because it would be really rude, but you think to yourself, how can she be at peace? Or how can he be at peace because I know what they're going through. And, 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 and you're like, man, if, if I had to live there, or if I had to, to, to live on that income, or if I had to drive that car, if that were my kid. But yet, she responds with peace. He responds with peace. And like the who's, there are people that regardless of what's going on in their life, regardless of life circumstances, peace. Could any of you use peace today? Don't raise your hand, don't nudge the person next to you. But did any of you come in here and maybe your anxiety level or your stress level was a little on peak? Many of you, just the thought of spending time with your family in seven days, does it send you into hides? Are any of you overwhelmed? And you need some peace. See, here's what Christmas does. This is just a thing. It's just a thing thing. Christmas is like a magnifying glass. 
Christmas is like this giant magnifying glass, and whatever is going on in your life, Christmas magnifies it. It could be good. All the good things in your life, Christmas magnifies it. But also all of the things that aren't good in your life, Christmas magnifies. So if you're lonely, what does Christmas do? It just magnifies your loneliness, right? If you, if you have financial strain in your life, what does Christmas do? It magnifies the strain in your life. It's just a thing, and this is what Christmas does. And so Christmas is this, this beautiful thing that exaggerates all of the bad while at the same exact time points to something absolutely incredible. And so the question is, how can you, how can I, despite life circumstances, be at peace? I wanna go back to a prophecy, and most of you know this, the first part of the Bible was the, it's called the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, everything written in the Old Testament is looking for, it's predicting something that's gonna happen, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And the Old Testament is full of these women and men called prophets, and the prophets would write these predictions or write these prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And one of the most famous ones was written by a prophet by the name of Isaiah, and here's his words. We've already heard them this morning in our Advent reading. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six. Isaiah the prophet writes this. He says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and then look what he says. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called, and then he uses four descriptors. Wonderful counselor, Mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, context, Isaiah, the prophet, is writing this 700 years before Jesus, and he's predicting or he's foretelling who Jesus is gonna be, and he uses these four descriptors or these, these four ideas, and he says, this is how the Messiah, this is how Jesus is going to engage with you. He's gonna engage with you as a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, and a Prince of Peace. It's interesting, if you look at that fourth one, Prince of Peace, what, he, what he's really saying is he, he's the author of peace. Or, or you could say it this way. He is the source of peace. That peace originates with him. That Jesus is the prince of peace, the source of peace, the originator of peace. And therefore, if you want peace, if you want to know peace, if you want to experience peace, if you want to walk in peace, then you've gotta to go to the source of peace, and that is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So how can you be like the who's? That regardless of your circumstances, how can you still respond to or be at peace? Here's the big idea I wanna to try to communicate to you this morning, you'll see it on the screens. See, peace with God, it paves the way to peace with ourselves and equips us to make peace with others. Now let's just break that down for just a second. Peace with God, peace with God. The first part says peace with God paves the way to peace with ourselves. And, and the reality is if you walk through those doors this morning and you're not at peace with you, right? There's probably something that happened in your past, right? There's something that you did or something that you said and you're carrying it along with you and you're trying to shake it, but it's like Velcro and you can't get rid of it. And, and there's something in your past that it's just hanging with you. And because you can't make peace with your past, you can't make peace with you. But when you make peace with God, when you understand that God paves the way, that God creates a way for you to have peace with you. Let me kind of unpack this a little bit. See, when you begin to understand that the God who created you has forgiven you, then you begin to understand that, that you no longer have the right to hold your past against yourself. See, when you begin to, to understand that the God who created you no longer holds your past against you, then you can't hold your past against you, and you begin to pave the way toward peace. And some of you this morning, you, you came in this room, and you could just really, you could really take some peace right now. You could really 
take some peace because you're carrying your past and it shows up in guilt, it shows up in shame, and it shows up in lies and all of these things that tell you that you're not lovable, that you're not okay, but the reality is peace with God paves the way for you to forgive yourself and to be at peace. And so what God is offering you and what God is offering me is a pathway to peace. And all the stress and the anxiety and the shame and the guilt, he says, I can free you from that. And there's a path to peace. See, God sent his son Jesus, this is what we celebrate at Christmas. Christmas is a rescue story. That God sent his son Jesus in the form of a human. He took on flesh and blood to be like us so that he could come and make a way so that you and me, someone as flawed as me, could be in a right relationship with God, right? And so we can take our lives and we can surrender our lives under the authority of Jesus. And we can put our lives under the authority of Jesus and we can go and follow him in baptism. And I'll look over here and there's the baptistry over there. And and there's nothing magical about the, the baptistry. It's just Duval's tap water, which is why there's a lot of chlorine in it. So you don't get things when you get in it, right? And, and, and you go under and you're immersed, right? It's, it's going public with your faith, placing your life under the authority. And you don't come up perfect, right? Everything's not okay. It, but, but there's something supernatural that happens is because the presence of God begins to reside inside of you. And when that happens, even if your life is, is chaotic, even if there's things that, that are not great, even if there's things in your past that you're, uh, that you're ashamed of, that, that, you, that you have so much guilt over, you can still, in the midst of that, experience peace. Because peace with God, what it does is it begins to pave a way for you and I to be at peace with ourselves. The second part of it is this. Not only does it pave a way for us to be at peace with ourselves, the, the second part is peace with God. It equips us to be at peace with others, to be at peace with those around us. If you study the teachings of Jesus, if you just look at the life of Jesus, if you see the driving ethic of the New Testament, the driving ethic of the New Testament is this, do unto others or treat others as Jesus has treated you. Right, now many of you know the golden rule. What's the golden rule? Lord, have mercy. <laughs> What's the golden rule? Yeah, something, I heard like 16 answers, but it's, it's treat others the way that you wanna be treated. Well, the golden rule stinks because Jesus teaches the platinum rule. He says, don't treat others the way you wanna be treated. He says, treat others the way that I have treated you. See, it's, it's a whole nother, it's like, it's like the golden rule on steroids. Treat others the way. And so when you become a follower of Jesus, you begin to realize that you are required to forgive others. Why? I am, as a follower of Jesus, I'm required to forgive others because why? I have been forgiven. It, 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 those of us who are followers of Jesus who've made peace with Jesus, we begin to understand that our obligation as followers of Jesus is to treat other people the way that God has treated us. And if you begin to understand this, you begin to see that this idea is in complete and utter contrast to the way that the world works. This is complete and utter contrast to the way that society works. This is complete and utter uh, uh, contrast to the way that social media works. In fact, if we did this, we would probably shut down social media because there would be no clicks. Like, oh, these people are just so nice to each other. And this is why Jesus if you study his life, that people weren't like him, they liked him. And, and those of us who are followers of Jesus, when we get this, we understand that, that we receive grace, that we receive compassion, that we receive empathy, right? And we receive the truth of God, and it begins to flow out of us. Yes, we stand on the truth of God, but it flows out of us in grace and love and compassion and empathy, and we receive peace, and then we give peace, because peace with God, right? Not only does it pave a way for us to be at peace with ourselves, but it begins to equip us. It begins to give us the tools to be at peace with those around us. And so peace with God, it's a big deal because it affects the way that you view yourself when you look in the mirror. It also affects the way that you see people around you at work and at school and in your family. So how do you get this kind of peace? 
They don't sell it at Target. It's not on Amazon. Where is this peace come from? And Jesus set up this story, and I love it when Jesus does this, because Jesus didn't always just, just teach like this. He would, set up a, he would set up a scene, he would set up something as a way to illustrate or a way to teach something, and he does this in Mark chapter four, verse 35. And so let's look at this together. Mark chapter four, beginning in verse 35. Here's the story. It says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up and high winds were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. And Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. And the disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Verse 41, it says, the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they ask each other, that even the wind and the waves obey him? Now, most scholars believe that Peter, the apostle Peter, who was an eyewitness to this story, that he gave his eyewitness account to a guy named Mark, and Mark wrote it down, and it became what is known as the Gospel of Mark. And so the Gospel of Mark is one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus. So why did Peter tell Mark the story, and why did Mark write it down in his Gospel, and we have it? Well, probably multiple reasons. One, one reason is I do believe that Mark is clearly communicating the authority of Jesus. Mark is saying Jesus is the son of God and that he has authority even over nature. John chapter one, right? In the beginning was Jesus. Jesus was the word. Jesus was with God. He was in the beginning with God. And it says all things were made through him and, not, and that without him not anything was made that was made. And so Jesus is the son of God and he has authority over nature. But what else is he teaching in this story, what is Jesus illustrating? Let's just take a closer look for just a moment. Verse 35, look what it says. It says, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, what did he say? Let's, let us cross to the other side of the lake so they get in the boat. Whose idea was it to get in the boat? Jesus' idea. Okay? Now this, I believe, is one of the hardest parts about following Jesus, right? Now, if I do something dumb, okay? If I do something dumb, if I make a mistake, right? I can, I can clearly look in the mirror, mirror and I look at myself and I go, idiot, right? I'm an idiot, right? I, I, I messed up, I made a bad decision, right? And we all know life works this way, right? There are consequences to your decisions, right? So you make a bad decision, you do something dumb, there are consequences to your decision, and you kind of like, okay, that's just kind of how life works. But, and this is what makes it hard about following Jesus, when you do the right thing, when you don't do anything wrong, and yet you get over here and things begin to be hard or rocky or uncertain, that becomes really, really hard. It was Jesus' idea that they got into the boat they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't make any wrong decisions, but yet they found themselves in the storm. I think there's a false belief out there sometimes that following Jesus will make your life easy when the reality is I think following Jesus will probably actually make your life harder. And so here are these guys in verse 37. They do what Jesus says. They get out into the lake and look what happens. Verse 37, it says, but soon... A fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Now context, these were experienced fishermen. These were, these were dudes that spent a lot of time on a boat. And so if they are panicked, 
being on a boat, then it is a really big storm. And, and, and Mark tells us the, the water is coming over and they're beginning to like try to get the water out of the, the boat. And, and the question I have is, where's Jesus? Well, he tells us, verse 38. I love the detail here. He says, Jesus was where? Sleeping at the back of the boat with a head on a cushion. Where does he get a cushion what is this, Delta Airlines? Well, he's sleeping in the back of the boat and he, and he has his head on a cushion. And what do the disciples do? The only normal, natural thing that any human being would do at this moment. They begin shouting. They begin shouting. You ever been here? Do you ever just, just wanna like look up at the heavens and, and just shake your fist and go, God, do you see this? Do you see what's going on around here? Are you aware? Are you sleeping do you care? And the disciples do the natural, normal, human thing, and they begin to shout, do you, do you care? But here's still the question. Where's Jesus? He's right there. He's with them. He's in the boat. Some of you right now, you're in a storm. There's a diagnosis. There's some financial strain in your life. There's some tension. There's some brokenness in, in relationship. I mean, Christmas is not looking Christmassy. And my question to you, where's Jesus? So even though you may not hear him, you may not feel him, he's right there, and this is what Jesus is teaching. This is why he allowed this situation to happen to these experienced boaters in a lake. Because he's trying to say to you, and he's trying to say with, to me, that even if you're with me, he's saying, even if you're with me, even if you, you're, 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 you're in me, he says, you're gonna experience storms. You're gonna experience turmoil in your life. But guess what? In the midst of that storm, you can still experience peace. You can still be at peace in the storm. Now, this is not denial. This is not bury your head in the sand. And this is not close your eyes and go, okay, when I open my eyes, everything will be better. No. This is the idea that you are fully aware of what is happening in your life and at the same exact time at peace. Look what Jesus said. These are Jesus' words. John 16, 33. Jesus says to you and to me, he says this, I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. Look what he says. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Let's just look at that for a second. Look at that second line. He says, again, if you're a follower of Jesus, here on earth, you will have problems. If you're a follower of Jesus, here on earth, your life will be hard. Here on earth, there will be sickness, there will be pain, there will be persecution, there will be cancer, there will be death. Jesus is saying to you and to me, you can just take it to the bank. You should expect it. Your life will be hard. And in the very next sentence, he says, but take heart. I've overcome the world. What's he saying there? He's, this could be translated, hey, don't give up. Hey, don't quit. Hey, don't, don't lose courage. Don't, don't let it overwhelm you. Don't let it overcome you. Just continue to take one step, one foot in front of the other. Take heart because I, in the end, I win. But go back to that first sentence. You can expect it. Your life will be hard. Bank it. It's part of our fallen, broken world. But, but you're not alone. You can take heart. You can, you can not give up. But go back to the first sentence. What does Jesus say? He says, I told you all of this so that you can have what? Peace. Where? In me. I have told you this so that you can have peace because of me. Oh, the prince of peace. The author of peace. The source of peace. The, the, 
the originator of peace is saying to you and to me that your life will be hard. You can just expect it, but, but you can keep going. You cannot give up. You can still put one foot in front of the other. And in the midst of whatever is happening in your life, you can still have this weird inner peace. In fact, the Apostle Paul describes it. He says it's a peace that you can't describe. It's a peace that passes human understanding. It's a peace that doesn't make sense. And your, your outward life circumstances can be terrible. But yet, in the midst of that, there's an inner peace that comes only from the source of peace, the Prince of Peace, the author of peace. Peace in me. Peace is possible because God has made peace with you and me. And then look at this. We'll go back to Mark 4 for just a second. What's the result or what's the outcome? So they have this whole thing. Jesus gets up. He calms the water. And then look how the disciples responded. Verse 41. It says the disciples were absolutely what? Terrified. Who is this guy? They said to each other, even the wind and the waves obey him. Now, you could look at this translation. It could be translated different ways. One of the ways it could be translated is the disciples were in awe. Or it could be translated this way. The disciples marveled at who is this guy? See, in the midst of whatever you're going through, in the midst of this crazy season, my prayer is that you'll be like these guys when it doesn't make sense, that you'll respond with awe, that you'll respond with wonder, that you'll respond with marveling, and that you, your curiosity will drive you to the source, the author of peace. Because the pattern is the same for all of us. A storm happens, a diagnosis happens, something happens, right? And then what happens? The anxiety and the stress and all that begins to build and we begin to shout, where are you, Jesus? And then maybe, because of community or maybe because of people in your life, they go, hey, 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 that's bad. But don't lose hope. Take heart. Because you, in the midst of all of that, can still experience peace. Because peace is possible. Because God sent the Prince of Peace. He took on human flesh born in a manger, he lived a perfect life, he taught, he healed, but best of all, he loved. And ultimately, it led him to a cross. And they nailed him to a cross. And on that cross, he took all your junk and all your sin and all that shame and all that guilt and all that stuff that you're dragging around with you, he took it on him so that you and me can be in a right relationship with God and we can take all of that and surrender it under the authority of Jesus. And that doesn't make our life perfect, far from it. In fact, it may make it harder. But yet in the midst of that, we can live with peace, a peace that transcends, a peace that passes human understanding. I'm gonna shift, I'm gonna shift this toward communion. Hopefully when you came in the door, you received a, a little packet. The Apostle Paul, who many of you know, he, he was one of the smartest guys there was. He went to the Harvard of the first century. He was brilliant. And he, he grew up with a mission to persecute, to, to, to get rid of what were, were people who were called followers of the way. They were followers of the way of Jesus, became known as Christians, followers of Christ. But along the way, he was on a road to Damascus. He had this encounter with Jesus, radically transformed his life, and then he became a church planter. He started churches. He would tell everybody and anybody about Jesus. But if you read his writings, you'll see along the way that he carried a lot of guilt and a lot of shame with him because he did a lot of harm. He hurt a lot of people. And he was on this wrestling like, okay, God, through you, I can find this peace. I can find what it means. And, and as we move into communion, I wanted to share the words that he wrote to the Christians in the, in the city of Rome. In Romans chapter five, beginning in verse one, this is what he wrote. He says, therefore... 
since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, it's by faith in Jesus we've been made right with God. He says, look at this. He says, we have what? Peace. He goes, I'm finding peace in my life through all this stuff that I've done, all that I've been through. And then he gets, ended up getting beaten. He gets chased. He, gets, he goes, but I found peace because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Verse two, he says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we can confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. See, we're made right with God because of Jesus. And you and me, can respond like the who's. <laughs> despite what's going on on the outside, despite what is gonna happen in the next week, we can respond with joy and with peace because God has made a way of peace with us. And that's what we're gonna celebrate right now in communion. Jesus took bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this to remember me. Then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood which is spilled out for you. Do this to remember me. So I'm gonna just invite us into a, a moment of prayer. I don't wanna rush this moment because I believe right now that, that, that God is shoulder tapping some of you in this room. And God, I pray that the peace that passes human understanding would wash over this place right now. God, I pray for those who walked in this room with anxiety, with tension, with stress, with pain. God, that they would, they would encounter the Prince of Peace right now. God, you're the source of peace. You're the author of peace. May peace just permeate this place right now. I'm gonna ask you to stay in a spirit of prayer. And those of you who are followers of Jesus, I'm gonna invite you to take the bread. Thank you, Jesus, for, for your body being broken for us. I'm gonna invite you now to take the cup that his blood was spilled out on your behalf and on my behalf. Peace is possible. It's not a self-help thing. It's, it's not a meditation thing. It's not some deep breaths thing. That, those all may help. But ultimate, true, inner peace can be found through the Prince of Peace, the author of peace, the source of peace, the originator of peace. God, may your peace rule and reign in our hearts right now. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.